Everybody, we are barking because it's after dark on a Monday, and that's what we do on Mondays. Uh, we're excited, man. I'm so excited about tonight's show. Uh, big fan of the guy we're having on, John T. Edge uh, from uh, the SEC Network's True South, um, and uh, published author. Um, fan, I mean, he's he's living the dream, really. He's he's living the life that I think Roos and I uh, really want to live in, in our heart of hearts. What's going on with you, buddy? Yeah, I think this is like what we try to do, right? Yeah, like this is uh, the way that we approach it. Um, we fancy good to have ourselves. A, we have a scholarly person on here too, man. It's mostly just <laughs> most of the time it's just us and our Dumbo friends just laughing yeah. at each other. Reprobates. Uh, so excited to talk to somebody who actually has something intelligent to say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Dude, um, no, how, was, how was Auburn, by the way? Uh, I um, didn't know you made a little road trip down. Uh, Bill Shanks had me on his radio show a little while ago, and he introduced me as as a man. And I said, I'm more zombie than man um, right now. I am, I'm definitely more zombie than man. I am, dude, I'm tuckered out. Uh, I stay that way kind of now that I'm 40. But um, uh, it was, I just, day trips suck, man. Day trips yeah. suck so bad. And uh, um, getting there seemed like it took no time. Getting back seemed like it took forever. Um, I, I told Palmer, I think at one point, I looked at the clock and it said we had an hour and 40 minutes to get home for about an hour. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it felt, but we, we may do, uh, watch a little out, you know, kept up with Alabama, Mississippi state and Tennessee, uh, South Carolina on the way home. It's pretty fun. But, um, anyway, Hey, listen, talking about games, Georgia's got a rank one coming up this weekend against Kentucky, uh, the Wildcats number 20 in the country after putting it on Florida on uh, Saturday. And, uh, if you want a ticket to that game time.co is your place game time. Tremendous, tremendous interface, uh, tremendous uh, uh, you know, just company in general. They do a great job taking care of their customers. Hey, if you want one six days ahead of time, you can get it. If you want one six hours ahead of time, they specialize in that too. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The, the, the interface of where you can click on the ticket and you see yourself, your view from a full stadium is absolutely incredible. Um, they lay it out there via price. Palmer's doing a great job putting it up there for us right now. It's a real cool place to buy a ticket. Go on over to gametime.co, that's .co, and check it out or download the app. Use the promo code DOGS. Conditions apply on this, but you can get $20 off your first order. Go check out gametime.co. And those folks make it possible for us to have guests like the one we're about to have, a guy that took out some time out of his busy schedule to check in with us. It's John T. Edge from true south and uh john man thank you so much for joining us buddy we really appreciate you that's my pleasure um thank y'all for watching the show i appreciate yeah. it huge fan I, huge i would fan. i would i would dare say john you uh you may be uh jones county's uh, uh most favorite son man i mean you uh you and todd hartley right now are kind of going at the title i would say i, I don't I, I don't know if Jones County would say the same. Uh, <laughs> Dude, I, one of my favorite things about going to Macon for the longest time when I used to cover recruiting was there is a spot there, you know, right there where you, I don't know what the name of the road is, but you turn off right there in Eatonton to go to Gray and uh, to get to Macon. And there used to be a little, there's a convenience store there and they had boiled peanuts out there and they were the best boiled peanuts in all of Georgia. I've had, I've, Roos can attest for us being on recruiting trips. I will snatch the car into a parking lot at 60 miles per hour to get a boiled peanut or a muscadine. Um, and they've got them and it's amazing. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a big boiled peanut boy. I was just talking to friends the other day about the sadness. One of the things that makes me sad about many things make me happy about living in Mississippi. One thing that makes me sad is the lack of boiled peanuts. Um, in, in Georgia, they were on street corners, you know, pickup trucks by the side of the road. You don't see them as frequently here. Um, and I miss them. I've got a pot of boiled peanuts on the stove at our house right now to try to rectify that. 
I, I feel like I got a business opportunity over yeah. in Mississippi. Based I was about on to say, saying, man. I was <laughs> about to say, Roos, write that down. Maybe that's where we. That's maybe how we make our first million. A fifty, a fifty-five go. gallon drum and a, a some salted <laughs> water. We'll be rolling, brother. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, John, I, I want to ask you. So, uh, True sure. South, how did it? You know, was it whose vision was it? And um, uh, if it wasn't yours, how did you become a part of it? So um, a number of people had a role in the beginnings of this. And, and uh, it was Rosalind Durant, who at that point in 2018, when we hatched this show, was the president of the SEC network and believed in the show, saw the possibilities. Um, Rosalind was the daughter of a barbecue pit master from South Carolina. So naturally, she saw the possibilities. But her vision was a big part of the beginnings of the show. And then you know, the the idea for the show, Wright Thompson and I um, live about eight blocks apart and about three blocks from his house and a little more than that from my house is a barbecue joint called Handy Andy here in Oxford that's really better known for his cheeseburgers. Um, and Wright and I had lunch there at a moment when the um, the network was open to entertaining an idea from us and the idea we hatched that day over cheeseburgers and fries and Cokes at Handy Andy was the show you now watch. And, um, and I still am flabbergasted sometimes that I get to make a television show. I'm a goofy ass boy, um, you know, and, and yet somehow they turn cameras on me and, and mic me up and, and I get to be the host of a television show that's actually pretty darn good. Um, in which I take great pride and in which making it brings me great joy. Like I get to hang out with my friend, right? Um, we get to meet amazing folks who cook, um, who cook really well, but also um, people who knit together a community. We get to be a part of that each time we, each time we make a show. And I, I'm still flabbergasted by that. You know, uh, you mentioned kind of coming up with it at a place uh, more famous for its cheeseburgers than its barbecue. How are the yeah. cheeseburgers? I, I mean, I got to ask. Uh, it, it's, it, is it a must check out in Oxford? It really is a great burger. Um, you know, flat top cooked, crunchy on the outside, um, those kind of frizzled edges at the at the, um, at the exterior, um, smushed um in the bags, there's so much weight. Like you get a stack of four burgers in a, in a bag and the burgers weigh themselves down um, and they steam a little bit in the bag. So by the time you get them home 20 minutes later, they're better. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a great burger. It's a really undeniably great burger. And especially if you'd spent the night out before and maybe overindulged, it's also a great grease soak of a burger. Mm -hmm. Well, we know all about that. We, are, uh, we know all about that on this show. Uh, all right. So I mentioned this to you before we came on. Um, all right. You're a Georgia grad, undergrad. I, I, I flunked out of Georgia. Oh, you I, flunked I out of Georgia. You went to the Georgia. University of Georgia. Okay. And, and now teach part-time at the University of Georgia, but I never graduated from that fine institution. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, obviously you had enough love to go to Georgia. Then you then you went to Ole Miss. Um, yep. What what does a college football Saturday look like for uh, for John Edge? Well, I can tell you what we did this Saturday. So this Saturday, um, we had some friends over and we sat on the front porch in our house. We live, a, you know, I mentioned a few blocks south of the square. So some friends came over. We sat and ate sausage biscuits and had Bloody Marys around ten on Saturday morning, and then um, all the while game days running and. My wife is probably more obsessed with college football than I am. Um, so she loves to get up early in the morning and watch game day. Um, my wife is a graduate of Auburn University. Okay. Um, uh, and Blair, my wife, does what her father told her to in terms of your affiliation, what team you cheer for. He always said cheer for your paycheck. Um, so <laughs> my wife is an employee of the University of Mississippi. So that's her first school. Her second school is Auburn, where she went to school, um, and where her father was dean of liberal arts forever and a day. Yeah. Um, and then so I work at the University of Mississippi. That's my first school. And my second school is um, is the University of um, is University of Georgia, and my third school is anybody but Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna win some fans by that one, John. <laughs> yeah. Especially the people who watch this show. 100%. Yeah. No doubt. 
No, I mean, uh, so was it, uh, I mean, was it, was it a little tense uh, on, I mean, or, 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 you know, Georgia yeah. Auburn going at it this uh, weekend? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, playful tense, like, you know, sure. um, you know, our, our day, you know, after the sausage biscuits, after, after watching television, most of the day we went down, there's a new brewery in town called circle and square. Um, really equidistant between campus and town and it's it's brand new um this fall and we went there and watched georgia alabama for much of it um then moved on and had some pizza at a, a place in town called saint leo and then got home in time to crank up the mississippi lsu game so there was tension but it was also playful tension even with the lsu fans to be honest like I, I we love the LSU fans because they're yeah. they're um you know they're they're all cooking in the street, um they're all um playful and goofy um when they're not angry um and um you know to be in Oxford on a game day you give yourself over to the rhythms of the game day, um you give yourself over to the town and just let let the town be let people have fun like watch it let it rush over you. You don't necessarily have to be out on the square till one in the morning to feel it. You can still hear it pounding through the walls of your house. It's wild. <laughs> uh, man, I tell you what, just listening to you describe that, I feel like I need to find the money to pay you to maybe, you know, record some affirmations for me on, on big days for myself. Cause that, I mean, it, that it sounds amazing, dude. It sounds awesome. And, you know, working in this business, I think the one, you know, I cover every game and, one of the things I really miss is the the idea of just enjoying everything that a game day is, um, because it's it's so much fun. It's a it's a big part of you know SEC and, and growing up in the South. I grew up in deep South Georgia. Jake grew up right around the Tennessee line in North Georgia. Um, so it's uh, it's it's pretty wild. Um, all right, so your book, uh, the the, yeah. the pot liquor papers. papers papers. That's right. I, I was I was drawing a blank on that when I wanted to set it. So the pot right. liquor papers. Um, where did that start and, and how fun was that to kind of go through and, 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 and grab the information, pick, cobble it together to write? Yeah. So I've been writing about Southern food culture for almost 30 years now. And um, this book, which is, is a history of the South told through food that begins in 1955, you know, really when the, when the civil rights movement begins and then moves forward to 2015. I basically called my own bluff because I've been arguing for a while that to understand the South, food is as important as music. Food is as important as literature. Food is as important as religion. But if I keep saying that, how do I prove that to myself? So I wrote this book to see if I could prove that to myself and, and maybe get somebody else to read it. Um, and, you know, I never... I never expected to write a book that was a straight up history of the region. Um, you know, there's a chapter here on fast food um, in the South, um, you know, that, that, that deals with Colonel Sanders um, in Hardee's and the beginnings of the drive through biscuit. Um, you know, and I, I wanted to look at the South and Southern food, not just in a traditional way, but to look at the South as it's changing. Um, there's a chapter toward the end that looks at, you know, taco trucks and and the like is kind of the modern day barbecue joints of the South. So I'm trying to make sense of what the South is historically and then bring it up to the present day. How is it changing? Um, in what ways is the South of today very different than the South of our grandparents' generation, but in many ways just the same? Yeah, I wanted to ask you too, John. Uh, obviously, I'm sure that there is a lot of interrelation or crossover between the book and and uh, the Southern Foodways Alliance. Um, yep. You know, I, I'm sure it was kind of sprung out of that, uh, in fact. But you know, how does that come about? Um, because I, I first off, I would say if you could, you know, brush our listeners up on what Southern Foodways Alliance is, and then also too, you know, where did that come from, man? Because it seems like a, a really um, a, a really cool idea that uh, uh, I think would, was probably pretty unique to pitch as well. Well, you're, you're, you're right in that, that, that it's all linked um, because, you know, the Southern Food Ways Alliance, which began in 1998 when I was in grad school here at the University of Mississippi, I started a symposium on Southern food with the, that same idea that, that food's worthy of study, food's worthy of celebration. Um, and 
over the years, what began as a symposium, as a, as a party with smart speakers, grew into really a, a media nonprofit. So the Southern Foodways Alliance um, collects oral histories. So an oral historian and, and, then, and then employees working um, for her and with that oral historian um, interview old guard fried chicken cooks and, and row crop farmers and, and oyster men and oyster women um, to document their lives, to make sense of the South through the lives of those working class, for the most part, people. Um, the Southern Viewways Alliance publishes a journal called Gravy um, and a podcast also called Gravy, both of which um, are available online. Um, the, the journal um, is published in collaboration with the Hub City Press out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. The podcast is on any listening platform you care to listen to, you can snag it. Um, um, the SFA makes films too. I've made over 120 um, short films about the South. So all of it using storytelling to help us understand this complicated place we live. Um, so yeah, it all fuses together. My book, The Work of the Southern Foodways Alliance, which I directed for 20 plus years and and now cheer on from the sideline. Um, but all those ways to tell stories about this place we know. It's we live in a complicated region, you know, and, and there are many things to celebrate here and there are many things to critique. Um, and food's a way to get at that. Um, food's a way to tell our story. Absolutely. And I, and I, one of the things I love about True South is the way you guys tell that story using that platform because you talk about there, there are things to critique. There are plenty of things to critique. There's plenty of things to love and you guys do it. And it's almost like that's what to me makes the South lovable, not because of the things that make it able to be critiqued, but because it's not perfect. And, right. and you, and you get to dig into it and, and the complexity of it all. It's, it's, it's amazing. I, I, go ahead. That's a John, really good point. No, no, that's a really good point because to me, one of the things I've come to understand is that to love a place is to want more out of that place, to mm -hmm. yeah. believe in that place, to believe more is possible, that we can be better, that we can be kinder, that, that um, you know, that life here can be more equitable, um, that working class people can, can get a leg up, that um, we all can be well fed and well educated. Like that, that critique is, is an instrument of love too. Like I love this place I'm from and I want more for the people of the South. And you can find so many profound, profound examples of that in an unexpected place. Like you would expect it to be all, you know, trying to find, you know, trying to find ways to make it better, but there, there are places that are actually making it better that you wouldn't expect them to be actually making it better. And it's, it's incredibly profound. I know years ago, you know, during the pandemic, a place where clear near where I grew up, the story that came out of Alma, Georgia, about the family um, that that you know had the um, the the uh, I can't remember the name. It's that blueberry plantation place where you know they, you know the the locals kept a, a fa an outsider family afloat during that whole time just by you know making sure that they took care of their own, which was just just an incredible story. One of the best things that came out of the pandemic, um, you know, for me. Uh, I may be asking you to pick between your two favorite kids. And I don't know if you have kids. I have plenty of them. Um, but <laughs> how many so you got? I've got four. Um, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> one of them, one of them's adopted. We adopted a young man whenever he was 14, 15 years old. My wife had taught him in first grade, inner city Athens, and uh, he has been a huge blessing on our life. But, uh, and then I have three of my own um, that, that I sired myself. Uh, now, <laughs> when, when, when talking about, you know, this, this marriage of the, the South and food and the way you bring those together. What, what's your, what is your biggest love affair with? Is it, is your biggest love affair with the South or is it your biggest love affair with the food? Um, It's the South. I mean, the food's just a way to get to it. You know, okay. I mean, this show, you know, food's just a conceit, man. I mean, food's just a way to get into people's lives. Food's just the way to get to know the South. So I'll give you an example. Like we made a show a couple of years back in Mobile, Alabama, and, um, you know, we filmed at a place called Cozy Brown's owned by a guy named Cozy Brown. 
Um, and Mr. Brown is open from like seven in the morning until seven at night, um, serving a steam table, three different kinds of grits, fried fish, shrimp. Um, that's just an amazing place. And it's a working class place. Like people walk in there splattered with paint, um, their boots caked with mud, their faces weary. Um, and Mr. Brown feeds them. He takes care of them. And Mr. Brown, when I was interviewing him, told me a story about a moment when um, he got in a tussle with a young man um, in the parking lot of his restaurant. Um, and that young man shot Mr. Brown in the chest. And Mr. Brown, a man of love and care and compassion, um, realized that that young man who shot him in the chest was hurting. Um, that the reason he lashed out was likely based on something else other than that moment in the parking lot. So Mr. Brown agreed to hire that young man in his restaurant, gave him a job, put him to work um, because Mr. Bland, Brown believed in second chances. Um, and so I run a TV show where I get to hear stories like that. And I got there because Mr. Brown serves really good fish and grits. Uh, but I stayed there because Mr. Brown tells me a story like that. And that to me is at the heart of what True South attempts to do. Like it's a food show, um, but it's not really. It's it's a show about identity, about about um, about what it means to be a Southerner in the year 2023. Yeah, absolutely. You uh, I, now one of the things I knew that uh, I wanted to ask you personally, and we'll probably touch on a couple of these, uh, but. Uh, how much time do you get to spend in Athens these days? Or do you get back over ever? Do you come back over the place? Okay. I do though. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that I flunked out of the university of Georgia. Um, I, I went on and got three degrees a after I flunked out. Um, and, uh, so now I teach in a low residency master of fine arts program there in the Grady college of journalism. So there's a narrative nonfiction MFA. So that puts me in Athens, about two and a half weeks out of the year, um, every year. And I've taught in that program since 2015. Yeah. 2015. So almost nine years I've taught in that program. Um, and I, I love, I love those students and I love too. you know, the redemption of flunking out of a place and then coming back to contribute to a place. It matters to me. And it matters when I talk to students too, because, you know, you, you're not defined by, you know, one moment in your life or one failure in your life. Um, we all get second chances. That's uh, that's, that's what the kids call a flex, John. You came back and you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, came back and you flexed on them. Uh, but no, I, what I wanted to ask you, John, was uh, yeah. in, in spending time in Athens, one of the questions we get regardless, uh, you know, obviously we, we work on a football website, but yeah. every week somebody's coming to Athens to eat uh, or for the first time and they want to know where to go, where to eat, what, where right. are the spots. Not only just where to eat, but when John T. Edge is in town, man, where do you hang out in Athens? I go a lot of different places. I mean, I am um, – um, my friend Jerry Slater has a bar called the Expat um, yeah. in Five Points. Um, and and I like hanging out there because they make good cocktails and because I like Jerry. Um, and his wife, Krista, has a, a great wine bar across town um, called Lark. Um, and I like going there. Um, I like Scott's Barbecue out in Norwood um, a whole bunch um, and go there. Um you know, Mayflower is about to close. I, I went to Mayflower when I was um, in college for biscuits and a sausage and cheese omelet. Am I right that Mayflower is about to close? Did they? Yeah, I believe so. I think so. Yeah. But the thing is, I feel like Mayflower has been about to close since I was in college. So it's right. it's one of those perpetual fugues. Well, it's like uh, uh, Weaver D's is kind of the same, yeah. way, right? And I, and I love Weaver's. I've known Weaver for a long, long time. Um, I love that sweet potato casserole of his, um, you know. Um, but, you know, I love Independent Bakery in Five Points. Yeah. Um, there's so many places. I like, um, oh, what's the, the barbecue joint that's in the old bar, that's in the old Walter's barbecue joint? Um, um, uh, White Tiger? No, um, uh, there's 
I'm, I'm trying to think of, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the old Walters barbecue joint is. Yeah, I don't know where that is. Walters was, um, there's a great picture of REM taken in the early 80s at Walters. Um, Tamez, T A M E Z. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was yeah, actually, so, that was one I was going to, I would I would have told you about. I, that's something that I try to tell everybody about. I've, yeah, I, I like really Tamez. I go, to, I go to Pulaski Street too. Uh -huh. um, but, but, more than any of the barbecue joints is I, I like um I like the Jones family. I like that barbecue joint a lot. We made a show in part about them when we made our Athens episode. Um Pablo Rivadaniera um and his Peruvian food is a is a big part of my rotation when I'm there. Um I go to the national a lot. I like the bar at the national. Oh yeah. Um, um I go to the Manhattan lounge for Blenheim and Makers, um, you know, um, we stay at the Indigo when I'm teaching so I can walk up to a lot of those places, which I, which I really like. I go to Taqueria del Sol for turnip greens um, and uh, enchiladas and the beef red chili, baby. Enchiladas verde. Yeah. I, I usually get the, the oh, green yeah. pork. Yeah. Their verde is amazing too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had so many places and for me too, you know, I like those places. I know many of the owners, and not because I'm a food boy, but because like I remember some of them from the time I was in Athens or lived in Atlanta. Um, you know, I only moved to Mississippi in '95, and um, I still keep a lot of connections back to Georgia. So I feel you know by coastal um, in that way. You know, absolutely. Well, listen, we uh, you know we we you've been really generous for your time, and and we've got questions we ask everybody when they come on here, and I'm. I'm I'm fascinated by the answer to my question because I feel like it's man that's lived as much life and has built as many relationships as you as has a good answer to this. I ask people, listen, man, you've you've met your end, right? You've you found you you're standing outside of your body, your face down in the ditch, and you're dead. And <laughs> you get to choose how you go out. You get to choose how we celebrate you or how we mourn you. Who uh performance, you know, order, oh. uh, you know, comedian, uh, uh, a musician, a, a singer, whoever. Who uh, who's performing at, at your funeral that you get to organize? Wow. Damn, this is a this is a tough and telling question. Um, what was your answer? I can't even remember. What did I say? <laughs> Probably about Tracy Lawrence. I mean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're big, we're big prime country guys. We're big of the 80, 90, 80s, late eighties and nineties country. Um well I, I'll tell you we we've had uh, we had, we had Don Rickles. Uh huh. Yeah, someone said Don up. Rickles. That was a yeah, good one. Yeah, I mean, you know, some irreverent comedians. Um, I just know I want it to be a, uh, you know, I, I want it to be somebody that can that can make people feel good and and send me out with kind of a little bit of a party. You know, so I, I've got I've got my answer. So, um, a few years back, just before the pandemic hit, my wife uh, booked us tickets to see Randy Newman. Um, in um, in Dublin, um, Ireland, like not Georgia, but Ireland. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, and, I, but uh, not, I didn't think Randy Newman was playing the uh, Dublin Peanut Festival. No, no, no. Oh, and he, he was wow. he was playing he was playing Dublin, Ireland. Um, he was playing on Father's Day, and my wife bought tickets, and we built a whole trip. But the but the excuse to go was Randy Newman because I, I think um, that um, good old boys. Um, is the best album ever made about the American South. Um, um, you know, it's a song cycle, a bunch of persona poems about people from Birmingham and, and people from Louisiana, you know, Huey Long. Um, and it's about what it means to be a Southerner when Randy was writing that, you know, looking back in the 1970s. And it still resonates today. I love that album. Um, and it's, it gets at some of that stuff we've been talking about. It's like Randy Newman is celebrating the South and critiquing it at the same time. Um, and I think it's a pitch perfect album. So if there's a way in which Randy Newman could, could um, sit solo at a piano um, and play the song Rednecks, um, I'd, I'd be really happy. Because that song is kind of wrapped up in mystery. It sounds like one thing, but it means something else. And uh, I think that's kind of what life is about. 
for saying one thing, but they really mean something else. I was at a piano bar one time in Memphis, and a guy, the, the guy playing that night, played like seven straight Randy Newman songs. Wow, and it was it was a blast. It was so fun. I don't know anyone who doesn't like Randy Newman. You know, it's like it, I would I would judge you a lot if you told me you did. <laughs> says a lot about a man. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. John, my question for you is um, one that uh, normally people don't have to think about too long, but maybe you will. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what is the worst hotel room you've ever stayed in? Oh, wow. So many bad ones. <laughs> um, I can tell you the worst hotel I almost stayed in. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, so in our first season of True South, we were making a show in Shreveport, Louisiana. And um, th it, this was actually in Bossier City, um, just, just across the river from Shreveport. And the restaurant on which we were focusing is still one of my favorite restaurants in America um, called Lucky Palace, um, owned by Quan Lim, who sadly um, died last year. Um, and we were there to eulogize him, right? And I went down for the memorial. Um, but that restaurant, which serves just beautiful Chinese food, um, high concept, beautiful Chinese food, um, you know, great roasted duck with hoisin and those little pancakes, um, these monster prawns cooked with ginger, a T-bone wok fried with garlic, and just crazy, beautiful food. It's in a no-tell motel, um, like the, the, the most no-tell of any motels you ever imagine. <laughs> um, the, it's, it's, such a, it's such a bad motel that like, the vin I don't know why this tells you it's a bad motel, but the vending machine stocks cans of Vienna sausages. <laughs> no, 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 that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and the, 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 the scum on the pool was forbidding, put it that way. It came uh, from the Vienna sausage cans is where yeah, it came Yeah, I think it leaked there from there. Vienna there sausage was, water in that pool, man. The effluvium <laughs> out of the cans. Um <laughs> But in one scenario of the show, like I was going to spend the night in the hotel so I could report from the hotel. And that came close to happening. But thank you, baby Jesus, it did not. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Well, hey, thanks for coming on. I do have one more true false question for you. Wright Thompson, he's a reprobate. True or false? Well, what is it? What do you mean by reprobate? <laughs> <laughs> Disaffectionately used. <laughs> um. I, 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 no, no, he's, he's like, I don't he know, seems but, like a little bit of a rap scallion to me. No, no, no. I mean, that's the kind of persona he wants to throw off. He wants to think he's a wild man, but he's a pussycat. You know? <laughs> he's, he's the pussycat's pussycat. Uh, gotcha. Hey man, thanks so much for coming on, dude. We appreciate you and best of luck with this season and, and further seasons. And listen, if you're ever in Athens, you've got my email. If uh, I, I listen, I'll put down a cocktail. So <laughs> that sounds great. And thanks for thanks for the interest in the show. And I hope y'all like this new season. The first one pops up October 10th. And we're excited about it. Looking I am too, to man. It. I am Looking too. Take to care, it. buddy. Thank you. Thank y'all. See ya. What a what, what a wordsmith. You know, what a <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I I wouldn't want to be I wouldn't want to be him necessarily, but I'd like to come close. I would. <laughs> are you kidding me man that sounds awesome i i i love how much he loves what he does too i it's do like, too so, yeah it, for sure it's so like it's there's a there's um a very clear affection in his voice when he's talking about you know not only the south but you know these people that he's met through it and stuff I, that's yeah. really cool man i mean i i love that I, and it reminds me a lot of like how you and i i guess over the years have talked about like various kids we met or, you know, various recruits that we watch kind of come along and see them flourish or, or, or even, you know, fizzle out just guys that you liked along the way. I think that, you know, that's always a good, uh, a good setup when you can come up with something like that, that, that kind of strikes you in that way. But I think that's such a cool way that he, he has found for himself to uh, kind of be the South's food guy, man. That's, that's a hell of a title. And i tell you what, I mean, you know me well enough to know that, if I got a chance to travel like that, it, obviously the food would be amazing, but the conversations and the relationships are 
Dude, I mean, sometimes I need a couple drinks in me. Sometimes I don't. But if I do get a couple drinks in me, I will talk to everybody that makes eye contact. Well, there's no question. I've seen you do it. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, if you, hey, how are you? You know, um, you know, so you looked at me. Let's talk. Um, uh, <laughs> that sounded like Adam Quinn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you asked for this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry that the last two hours of your life have gone by. And we've talked about, you know, crawfishing and Pudding Creek and, and Pearson, Georgia. But um, yeah, man, I, I think what he does is really incredible. And one of the things that really got me, so I, I had seen the show a few times before I'd had it on in the background and, you know, he'd been going to these places and, and it was more of a visual thing. You know, it was more of a visual thing. It was almost like a, a more cultured diners, drive-ins and dives that was a yeah. little bit more local. And I'm looking at the food and I'm like, man, those, you know, that chicken and dumplings looks outrageous, man. That looks awesome. And then you start hearing him talk about, um, you know, how the owner of a, uh, of a, you know, and I'm just using an example here of a, of a Thai place in, um, you know, rural Louisiana or somewhere outside of Baton Rouge and how she came to, you know, how the owner came to America and how her mom had came to America. She was barely born in America and, and, you know, all that stuff. And it's just, the storytelling is just fantastic. And it's a, uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And he's right, man. You can't, you know, I would totally agree with the idea that I like music just fine. I'm not crazy, you know, got to have music on every time I'm doing something, um, you know, and I'm not a particularly religious person um, at this point in my life. But, you know, food, everybody, everybody's got to eat. Oh, sure. And, 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 you know, there are very few people in this world that will tell you, ah, it's not big on food, man. It's not big <laughs> on food. That's true. There, there are some. There are some. Oh. I've met them. I don't trust those people. And <laughs> I, I watch them very carefully. Uh, no, that's, I, yeah, I agree completely, man. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, don't, you know, you know that when he was sitting there talking about some, you know, Chinese food in, in Shreveport, Louisiana, you know, I'm up here recording that in my mind. Yeah. I'm like, oh boy. Oh, I saw I your face. When, yeah. he started talking about, when he started talking about hoisin and, and the pancakes, I was like, yeah. mm, here we go. Barbecue yeah. for the Asian lover's delight. For the Asian lover's delight. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, man, it's like I said, it's it's cool. It's cool. So um, should we hop into a little Jake on Jake here? Yeah, let's do it. Let's see. Let's, let's get a little Jake it. on Jake going. And, and I'm going to stick with our, our, uh, Jake John, our, John, our John T. Edge themed uh, show tonight. Uh, and I'm just going to ask you, man, like, Where's the spot uh, for you um, in your hometown, right? Like they go around to all these different little places and, and go to these these towns. They're bigger towns. I mean, obviously Shreveport's a larger, a much larger town than Pearson, Georgia. But uh, the Jake Rowe culinary tour of uh, Pearson starts where? There's not a whole lot there anymore as far as Pearson goes. Um, but I will say this, man. Um, growing up, there was, and it was only open for breakfast and lunch. And I grew up in this place. Like I, I grew up in this place. The, the lady who owned it, we called her Aunt Wilma. Um, she was not, uh, as far as I know, she may not even be in any relation to us at all, but she definitely was not my aunt. Um, it was Wilma's Cafe. And a little place right there off of Highway 82, almost at the intersection of Highway 82 and 441, almost right there in the corner, right down from Hinky, uh, Hinky Matthews Tire Shop. Um, if you never, hey, listen, I got to tell you about Hinky Matthews first. Short, stocky man, strong as an ox. wore a uh, wore a flat top every day of his every day that I ever knew him. Um, talked so fast you couldn't understand a word that came out of his mouth. I mean, there, there must be something about tire guys because I feel like I knew a guy like this too. Like, yeah, you know, like old school tire guys. Like they're they're, they're that's a dying breed of dudes, man. Yeah, I th I saw him take. Uh, I'm not. I don't know tire sizes like off the top of my head, but it had to have been like a 300. He took a he took a uh, Mickey Thompson off the truck, just I, and this man was seventy years old at the time. Just grabbed it, bear hugged it, and just took it off and walked it over into the shop. I mean, one of the just strong as an ox. But Wilma's Cafe was right down from his place, and I used to I used to eat eat breakfast in there a lot with my grandfather. I had my 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 mom's dad's name was Theopolis, Papa Theopolis. And we used to go in there. Uh, actually, when he passed away, you and, and me and Noah had some drinks to, to celebrate yep. the life of Papa yep. Theopolis. Um, he used to take me in there for breakfast all the time. And it was awesome. It's where I learned to, you know, crush my over easy eggs up into my grits. 
uh, with the sausage, make your breakfast scramble. Still eat it to this day. We'll eat it six days a week um, if I've got the time to make it. Uh, but they, it was a meet and three. And they knew my order when I went in. And I wouldn't go in on the days that they didn't make mashed potatoes because the <laughs> cream, mashed potatoes were unbelievable. Uh, I'd go in there and I would get fried chicken. Oh, man. How about that's Cowboy Cafe for a little while, but that's it. That's 100% Wilma's Cafe, except it used to just have Wilma's up there without a cafe. There was no phone number, no anything like that. Used to come in the back door all the time, too, because my mom worked at the Georgia Power Office, which was kind of catty L-shaped behind there. And I would bust out the back door of the Georgia Power Office and walk back through and walk through the kitchen. And I would tell Aunt Wilma my order as I went back. Um, never paid for it. My mom would pick it up later on in the week or something like that. You know, she'd whatever, but, uh, Miss Lenny and Aunt Lolita and all those people who worked there. Um, but yeah, they, I'd get fried chicken with two mashed potatoes, one with gravy and one without. And, uh, and, uh, what a kind of sewer. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> and, uh, they always brought me extra cornbread and biscuits, both. It's probably why I look the way I look today, all them carbs. And, uh, and I would always get, if they had mustard greens or collard greens, I'd get those way bigger on mustards and turnips than they were collards. Um, or, uh, you know, if they didn't have any of those, I'd get uh, green beans. By the way, that, that name right there, Shea Browning, uh, Shea Browning is my, is absolutely, absolutely my cousin. So, uh, his, uh, his, um, I believe his dad was my grand is my grandmother's first cousin. So, um, but yeah, we, we had a, and man, that place, I miss it. If it was still there, I'd make trips home to go eat there. It was, uh, it was fantastic. And it was the perfect place to go when I worked with my summer with my dad as a contractor. Um, my dad was a contractor and he built, built, you know, did handyman stuff, but he also built a few houses. Um, if you were working hard, you went in there, it was the perfect place. Cause you'd get plenty to eat, but not so much. You didn't feel like going back to work. Sure. Um, so that, that actually made it work. And it was like seven bucks, seven bucks, meat and three. Sweet tea, everything included, no tax. Um, outrageous. I don't think I ever had a dessert there, though. I don't think not once that I ever ordered dessert. It seems like a stuff. mistake. I bet they were delicious. Yeah, I, I know they used to have peach cobbler. I, growing up, I didn't like peach cobbler a whole lot. It was kind of slimy. A what about bit. banana pudding? Um, no, I don't remember much banana pudding. Oh, interesting. I, I would assume. I, there, was I, a, I hmm. there was a place on the other side of town at 441 North called uh, Corbett's Family Restaurant. It started out on 82 East um, as 76 Restaurant because it was that old truck stop. And uh, Corbett's used to have jam up banana pudding. They'd put it out there in a, in a tray. I saw Wilson Polk, who is the uh, who is the uncle of Trisha Yearwood, by the way. Um, he, uh, I saw Wilson Polk almost put them out of business one time eating their banana pudding. <laughs> he ate like a pound and a half of it at one time. In the was, right in the right headspace, I too could do that. So. Yeah, I could too. You know, me and Wilford Brimley be on the same medication. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Diabetes. Uh, well, listen, I, I, I'm I'm not going to let you ask me that question without giving you the same, you know, opportunity to do the same. What what you doing? What what's what's going on up in Blue Ridge, McKaysville, Copper Hill, Tri State area? Man, it's like it's so weird. Uh, I mean, I, I figured you'd probably ask me the question back, and so I was kind of thinking of what I was going to say, and like it's so weird how far things have changed since I yeah. was a kid, man. I mean, blue, like Blue Ridge is like thinks it's some sort of resort town so there's like all these nice restaurants and and um that kind of thing and they're good i mean don't get me wrong i mean it's 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 good food um but you know if i'm trying to do something kind of local trying to do something uh there's a there's a good japanese spot that a guy from um the calhoun area uh came up here to start running and i i eat there I try to eat there twice a week, um, uh, but definitely at least once a week. Um, and I started really loving the place because they had Tropicalia on draft. And they were like one of the only places to do it and only places to get it. But the food's really good, too. And they're one of those places that um, it's called Kazuna is the name of it. And they're one of those places, too, that like if they got it, they'll probably make it for you. Like, hey, you know, they've got the ingredients. They can put together whatever you want. Um, and they're just good people. So I like supporting them. Um, the real answer, well, there's, there's Las Dos Huastecas, which is a, uh, a, a taco joint, uh, that does some incredible, uh, enchiladas verdes, just out of this world, verde sauce on those things. Um, we've got 
And we have an absurd amount of Mexican food up here. Like in Copper Hill, Tennessee, there, which is technically where I live, there are 400 residents in the city. We have three Mexican restaurants and they're all on the same street. So we got a Mexican restaurant for every 120, every 130 people in this, uh, in the place. And none, and they're all, and they're all about the same. None of them, none, none's any better than the other, unfortunately. Um, but the and real, they're probably like your run of the mill, you know, uh, Mexican, you know, food is like, it's, I mean, on its worst day, it's not bad. And, exactly. on a, yes. and on its best day, it's probably not transcendent. It's just no. it's just good, strong food usually. Yep. No, exactly. But the real answer to this question is because it's the thing like when I was in college and when I was living in Athens still, when I would come home, the thing that I would seek out was Papa's Pizza. Um, <laughs> and Papa's Pizza, listen, Papa's Pizza is it's a chain. They're they're all over the place now. But the original Papa's Pizza is in McKaysville. It started in McKaysville. And so it was all launched out of this little bitty trailer over off of uh, Highway 5, Blue Ridge uh, Drive. And I tell people all the time, it's not it's not even close to the best pizza I've ever had in my life. Um, it's some people would say it's not even very good, um, probably. But in my mind, it, this is there is the Papa's Pizza. Uh, that's that, that was before it burned down. Um, uh, and they rebuilt it. Um, but that is, that is the Papa's pizza. Uh, also too, they got that yogurt sign up. They had Columbo yogurt and I think they still have it. Last time I Googled that, that was available in like one, I think I couldn't find a place where it was available in America. So I don't know where they have, how they have it. Uh, it seemed to be very prevalent in Indonesia for some reason. So I don't know. I don't know how those are the two destinations Columbo has uh, sought out. Um, but the pizza just at a very base level in my mind is what pizza tastes like. And so yeah. there's like something special about it, man. There's something craveable. And it's weird because I hear that from people a lot, man. Like kids who grew up here. Yeah, I've seen you mention it on Twitter before and people absolutely. comment on it. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things that like people um, like people who've moved away or like people who, you know, live um uh in different places like they'll still be like oh man you know like i could really go for some some uh killer sticks which are just cheese sticks um uh today and, and nobody can really figure out why and the one in blue ridge was never as good the one in lj is not as good the one in mccaysville though is the one everybody loves and i think it's partly because that place basically raised every sports team every uh yeah. club every i mean I had I had talked to somebody once and they said like I know like 10 phone numbers in the world and one of them is Papa's Pizza. And like everybody does though. That's the thing. Everybody knows Papa's phone number. And um I mean, I said one time on Facebook, it's probably one of if you really if I really sit back and think about it, outside of my immediate family, it's there's no question in my mind I've called Papa's Pizza as it, top 10 in my life. It's one of the top 10 most called places I've ever had. So uh, I always get killer sticks. Um, I get a little uh, side of the Marzetti ranch uh, and an extra, um, an extra cup of marinara sauce, man. And it always hits man. Papa's uh, the McKaysville Papa's is a, it's a true, it's a hood classic. The kids would say. So, yeah. I can uh, understand. I can understand the charm of a place like that. Yeah. You know, like I said, I mean, like it was, Everybody ate it all the time. For and, every the, and the fountain Dr. Pepper there probably tastes different than any other Dr. Pepper you've ever had. <laughs> sure. No, exactly. It's probably, like a little mold, of- probably a little mold in the line that adds a little flavor to it. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's the thing, though. It's it's always been that way. Um, and I don't know. I, I have such a soft spot in my heart for Papa's Pizza. Yeah. No, I get it, man. I get it. And that's, you know, Wilma's was a little bit that way too, because I would, in no way would I ever say that's the best fried chicken, best mashed potatoes I've ever had. Don't get me wrong. Like I could, I could eat a gallon of them right this moment. Cause I'm pretty hungry. Um, but I, there's probably, I would take Popeye's fried chicken over their fried chicken, but there was a, there was a taste to it, a flavor to it. That was just it was different and I miss it. And I can, I can still like imagine it enough to actually taste it. It's pretty cool. I would, I would, when I lived in Athens, I would drive to Crawford because they had a Papa's pizza there. And I don't know if it's still open, but they had a, a Papa's in Crawford. And sometimes, man, I just get the itch and I'd really need some killer sticks. So I'd make the trip over to Crawford, maybe get a pizza sub too. 
also a very delicious uh, offering there. But when I came home on the weekends, I was that was I, I was a must stop. Now it's now I eat there all the time, unfortunately. All right, folks, listen, if you've been, if you're watching or if you're listening, um, we're sorry we've kept you from whatever you were doing. Uh, this has been us once again indulging ourselves with Bark After Dark. Y'all take care. Uh, we'll be back next Monday and we'll do something. We don't know what it's going to be, but we love you very much for listening and we appreciate it. Y'all take care. Oh, oh.